Sakari, is it okay? Okay, very good. All right, well, I'm sorry for the slight delay, but good evening, everyone. I'm Adrienne Laris, the president of the Mountaintop Historical Society. I'm delighted to have everyone join us this evening. Um, and thank you very much for joining us. If you're a member of the Mountaintop Historical Society, thank you very much. Um, if you're not, please consider becoming a member. Um, members are very important partners in the work of the Historical Society. I'd also like to thank Stewart's Shops for their support of this presentation. Tonight, our presenter is Diane Galusha. Her topic is the C Civilian Conservation Corps in the Catskills, including a very active camp in Tannersville. For those of you who are joining us from outside the area, and I don't know how many actually are, um, the Mountaintop Historical Society is located in Haynes Falls at the top of the Catterskill Clove. It's a very special year for us. It's our 50th anniversary. Our plans to celebrate include a gala dinner at the end of August. We hope you will join us then. More details will be forthcoming. Our mission since 1973 is to discover, preserve, interpret, and share the history of the great Northern Catskills. Many of our programs follow our signature approach and combine history with hiking. We have a 50 acre campus encompassing several buildings, including the fully restored 1913 UND train station listed on the national and state historic registries. We serve as a trail fret head for the Catterskill Rail Trail, a part of the Hunter Area Rail Trail Network. We have a visitor center with an archive that contains some 7,000 artifacts. Our next program will take place on Sunday, May 7th. It is a tour of the Hunter Synagogue given by Carol Slutsky Tenorowitz, who, who is the president of the synagogue's um, board of directors. Registration is required, so please visit our website at www.mths.org to register. By now, most of us must be familiar with Zoom to ask questions. Use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have any difficulty, please send a message via Q&A. We will try to troubleshoot. Individual videos are disabled and microphones are muted. Chat is also disabled. Now, I am very happy to turn the program over to Johanna Titus, who will introduce Diane. Johanna is our program chairperson. Thank you, Johanna. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Diane Galusha, a longtime resident and friend of the Catskills. Diane is an author and a former journalist with a passion for history. She is the founder and president of the Historical Society of the Town of Middletown in, De in Delaware County. She served as the editor of the Catskill Mountain News in Margaretville from 1989 to 1996. She's an expert on the history of the many reservoirs that dot the Catskills. She wrote the book on New York City's watershed, Liquid Assets, A History of New York City's Water System. After years of working closely with communities most affected by the creation of the reservoirs, she recently retired from her role as communications director and education coordinator for the Catskill Watershed Corporation. Her other books include through a Woman's Eye, Pioneering Photographers of Rural Upstate, and When Cauliflower Was King, and the book related to tonight's presentation, Another Day, Another Dollar, The Civilian Conservation Corps in the Catskills. Uh, last year, as part of our Black History Month celebration, Diane spoke to us about the history of slavery in Delaware County. And we are very pleased to have her join us again. So welcome, Diane. Um, I will be on the side and help you out with questions when you're done. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I um, appreciate um, being invited back. It's always a pleasure to talk history with other history lovers. And uh, so thank you to the Mountaintop Historical Society and congratulations on your 50th anniversary. Wow, that is a milestone. That's fabulous, wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to 
hear more about your uh, August gala, maybe uh, uh, maybe attend that. That sounds like fun. Um, I uh, am very happy to um, be here actually to uh, talk about, um, hold on a minute, let me see if I can get this going here. Um, to talk about a really interesting um, period in American history, uh, which um, uh, the 1930s, as a matter of fact, which uh, you know was was um, dominated by the Great Depression, um, a lot of uh, uh, fascinating history to be gleaned from that period, um, economic political, uh, social um, initiatives and, um, and movements uh, took place then, and they continue to have relevance today from social security to rural electrification, uh, public works projects like schools and roads and bridges and airports, uh, wonderful works of public art, the preservation of historic sites, the development of our national parks, uh, the reclamation of farmlands. The 1930s was definitely a time of and for the people. These government funded program projects and programs were lifelines to struggling workers, farmers and families in this desperate time. Uh, but they've also left us places and programs that are enjoyed and appreciated today. These include many campgrounds and forest plantations here in the Catskills. So another uh, day, another dollar, uh, a million days, I'll be a millionaire. That uh, strangely hopeful saying is believed to have first been uttered by someone in the Civilian Conservation Corps or the CCC. This was a federal program born in the depths of the Great Depression that put young men to work in the nation's parks and forests, paying them $30 a month, a dollar a day, which was a princely sum at a time when jobs were pretty hard to come by, a time when millionaires were a rare breed indeed. The CCC was established in 1933 Former New York Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt had just taken office as the 32nd President of the United States, following a couple of years as Governor of New York State. He defeated in a 1932 landslide Republican Herbert Hoover. Now, Hoover had been blamed by many for failure to pull the country out of the depression that had been precipitated by the stock market crash of 1929. By the time Roosevelt took office, 12 million people, almost a quarter of the nation's workforce, were out of work. Mortgages had been foreclosed on thousands of homes and farms. Bank failures had swept away savings. Factories had shut down, cutting industrial production to the lowest level ever recorded. Mines had closed, railroads had gone bankrupt. Men who had once been able to support their families were reduced to selling apples on street corners or traveling the countryside looking for odd jobs. Bread lines kept some people alive. It was estimated that unemployed youth numbered 5 million. Many who quit school at 13, 14, or 15 to try to help their families found themselves hitchhiking around the country in search of work. Well, FDR wasted no time in addressing this situation. On March 9, 1933, five days after assuming the presidency, he called together the secretaries of war, agriculture, and the interior, the director of the budget, and others to discuss an idea to put unemployed young men to work on forestry, flood control, soil erosion, and other natural resource conservation projects. It took only hours for this group and their staffs to draft a bill that would win passage in both the House and Senate less than three weeks later. 
The Emergency Conservation Work Act created what came to be known as the Civilian Conservation Corps. I want to show you this um, uh, patch, this embroidered patch, which was the official patch of the CCC. It was created by Stuckey Embroidery Company, which was then located in New Jersey, and which later relocated to Boyceville and was there for many, many years uh, until recently, known for um, their um, American flag production. Um, so they uh they they this patch actually um you know kind of has its genesis really i like to think um in the cat skills the department of labor set up the system to enroll men aged 18 to 25. the agriculture and interior departments developed the work sites and projects the War Department was given the challenge of organizing the enrollees into companies, feeding, clothing, equipping, and housing them, and su supervising their life in generally, uh, in, in, I'm sorry, in specially constructed camps across the country, and in Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. On April 6, 1933, by the way, 90 years ago today, less than a month after the president called the first meeting to discuss this new initiative, the first recruit was enrolled in Pennsylvania. Um, and on April 17th, the first camp, Camp Roosevelt, opened in Luray, Virginia. By July 1st, 1933, 1,300 camps were in operation manned by 275,000 enrollees. Over the next nine years, before an improving economy uh, and World War II eliminated the need for the CCC, three and a half million young men would serve at 4,500 CCC camps. They became known as Roosevelt's Forest Army. There were 161 CCC camps in New York State. They operated for different periods of time and for different purposes. 11 of them were located in the Catskills and just beyond. In a moment, I'll describe four of them whose work uh, impacted the mountaintop region and environs. First though, let me give you an overview of how the system worked. Uh, <clears throat> companies of about 200 men were often moved from camp to camp around the country, and their makeup changed as enrollees came and went. Men signed up for six month stints, and they could re-up for a total of 18 months, but after that they would have to get out of the CCC for six months before they were eligible to rejoin. Some found jobs on the outside and were honorably discharged. Others went over the hill, going AWOL and receiving a dishonorable discharge. So some men spent weeks, others years with the CCC. They were paid $30 a month, $25 of which had to be sent home uh, to their families to help them through the desperate depression days. Enrollees could keep $5, which they spent on toiletries or recreation or whatever they wished. They were given personal hygiene items, work clothes, uniforms, shoes, boots, coats, rain gear, underwear, and not insignificantly, three square meals a day. The camps were run by regular and reserve army officers in military fashion with a certain spit and polish discipline. Many of the officers were veterans of World War I you can see by these leftover uniforms. Work projects were planned by agents from the State Conservation Department, the Soil Conservation Service, or the USDA, who maintained quarters at the camps and organized the work crews. The National Park Service also provided guidance for the camps that were working at state parks and historic sites. There were 44 of those camps in New York State operating outside the state forest preserves. 
These included Gilbert Lake State Park in Lawrence, Otsego County, where the New York State CCC Museum now welcomes visitors. Camps were little villages, usually with five 40-man barracks buildings, a mess hall, a tool house, a garage for a dozen or so trucks and tractors, water and sewage facilities, streets and sidewalks, a recreation hall, a camp store, uh, and an education building where enrollees could take classes and everything from photography to plumbing to prepare them for life after the CCC. Many camps put out their own mimeograph newsletters. In Tannersville, it was called the Tannersville Tiger. Most were junior companies made up of men aged 18 to 25. A percentage of each camp was made up of youth from neighboring towns. Well, a lot of um, city youth were accommodated in these companies, but each, each uh, camp uh, allotted spaces for, for folks from the immediate area. At first they had to be on relief rolls, but later the rules were relaxed to allow those who were not on official assistance roles to participate. African-Americans lived in segregated camps, but sometimes when there weren't enough of them to make up a company, they were allowed to attend white camps. There were also camps for Native Americans on or near reservations. Women were not permitted in the CCC. However, it may not surprise you that Eleanor Roosevelt urged camps be devised to house homeless and jobless young women. They were sometimes referred to as she, she, she camps and uh, probably uh, would make a, an excellent uh, side program at some point. Uh, veteran companies were established for veterans of any previous war, no matter their age. Veterans were allowed to join the CCC after Roosevelt issued an executive order in May of 1933 in an effort to appease veterans who had marched on Washington seeking early payment of a promised 21-year endowment life insurance policy for their World War I service. They didn't get their so-called bonus. In fact, at their first march in 1932 in Washington, they were attacked by federal troops led by General Douglas MacArthur. But on their return to DC in 1933, they were offered jobs in the CCC. And with the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, uh, another of the New Deal work assistance agencies. About a quarter million veterans served in the CCC over the next nine years. The Livingstonville and Narrowsburg camps housed veteran companies at various times over those years. Local experienced men, LEMS, were loggers, carpenters, blacksmiths, tractor drivers, mechanics, and others employed from the local area to maintain equipment and train the green recruits on tree cutting and planting tool use and safety. Putting these men to work also helped relieve local unemployment. Local doctors and clergymen were engaged to provide medical exams and treatment and to conduct worship services. CCC enrollees worked eight hours a day, five days a week in all kinds of weather. When they weren't working, they were eating and relaxing and playing and doing laundry and taking classes in the evenings. On weekends, they played baseball or basketball or had boxing matches with other camps or local town teams. And they went to dances in nearby communities. Many young men met and married local girls and stayed to make their homes here. So let's look at four principal Catskills camps. Camp P-53 in Boyceville, 10 miles east of Kingston, was among the first CCC camps to be set up 
in New York State. You can see the barracks buildings in the center of this photograph. This is um, uh, really just about where the, um, uh, the, the right, kind of right across, right across from where the school is today, Aniora Central School. Um, so this camp, P-53, opened in June of 1933, just two months after the first CCC camp in the, in the nation opened in Virginia. Boysville was set up to combat white pine blister rust and to guard against infestation from gypsy moths, both of which were harming forests and their potential for lumber production recreation and wildlife habitat. Camp P-53 was colloquially known as a bug camp. Enrollees were assigned to look for gypsy moths and their host gooseberry bushes to prevent the insect spread up the Hudson River. One enrollee told me project leaders tacked fake egg clusters to trees to test their ability to find them. But in two years, they never found a real one. One man, a local recruit told me they did find a bee tree, however. They cut it down and retrieved upwards of 200 pounds of honey. The Boysville men also built log structures to stabilize banks and create fish habitat along area streams. They built a fire tower on Slide Mountain, the highest in the Catskills and constructed campsites at Woodland Valley State Campground in Phoenicia. This is the, uh, the campground's office. It's a, a former cabin turned into an office. Now this is the only building, uh, original building left um, there at the, uh, at the campground. They also helped build the state's first mechanized ski area, the J. Simpson Memorial Ski Slope, in 1934 in Phoenicia, part of which was on state land. The Margaretville CCC camp assisted in this project, and sadly, one of its enrollees was killed in a dynamite accident there. This really was the beginning of the ski industry in the Catskills, followed by Bel Air, Hunter, Wyndham, and many smaller mountains. Um, up in Schoharie County, Break of Bean Camp 93 operated from 1934 to 1941. This was largely a forestry camp. Over seven years, its young occupants planted more than 8 million trees in Schoharie, Green, and Delaware counties. The average number of men working in the field every day was 120, and they planted an average of 60,000 trees a day. These were red pine, black locust, scotch pine, Norway spruce, white spruce, Japanese larch, and white ash, most of the seedlings coming from the state's Saratoga nursery. To plant, seed, to, to plant trees, men were stretched across the hillsides in long lines, one digging up the sod with a mattock, his partner carrying the bucket with tree seedlings placing a seedling in the hole and pressing it down with his boot. One giant step further, the process was repeated, and so on and on and on for hours on end. More than 80 years later, we can walk in the shade of their efforts all over the Catskills and beyond. Camp 93 fought several brush fires and also built the 68-foot-tall Mount Utsianta Fire Tower in Stamford, in 1934. This is among five Catskill Mountain Towers that have been restored and which welcome visitors today. Camp 93 also built the concrete dam across the Schoharie Creek in Prattsville that keeps coarse fish from ascending from the Schoharie Reservoir into trout waters upstream. They worked from a temporary uh, tent camp while the Prattsville project was constructed. This barrier, by the way, emerged unscathed following Irene, the storm that devastated Prattsville just downstream. 
Um, I understand that a plan to remove it, uh, there has been a plan to remove it and that it has been scratched. I hope that's the case. It would be a shame to lose that. In the spring of 1934, a CCC camp was built in Tannersville on Clum Hill overlooking Rip Van Winkle Lake. It was called naturally Camp Rip Van Winkle and was home to Company 291, the Tannersville station of the Stony Clove and Catskill Mountain Railway Railroad was conveniently located nearby. And that's how enrollees uh, and officers came and went. Um, enrollees first built their, their own barracks, mess hall, recreation hall, and other camp structures, as well as the beach that remains today. You can see they lived in tents while the camp was being constructed. Then they tackled the development of North Lake State Campground in uh, Haynes Falls. They built 100 fireplaces, 150 tables, two bathhouses, and a beach. They raised an earthen dam to elevate the lake level, built a 10,000 gallon concrete reservoir, several latrines, an amphitheater, hiking trails, and other amenities to make North Lake State Campground a major tourist attraction. A three mile campground road was constructed with the assistance of a cadre of veteran CCCers from Livingstonville operating from a temporary tent camp. Company 291 fought a huge forest fire at the improved campground in 1935. Uh, fires were a big threat to state lands. The Stony Clove had been ravaged several times. Of course, the state um, investing so much money and, and manpower into planting these, uh, these um, um, plantations for us over the, in the 1920s and into the 30s um, were, were, you know, the state was pretty desperate to find ways to protect them. And so they built the fire towers and, uh, and fire ponds uh, such as this. Uh, they would find uh, an existing um, spring and uh, develop it a bit and then line it with stone. And this would provide water for um, first responders in the midst of the forest. They could fill up their Indian tanks here and, um, and, and, and fight a fire um, where they couldn't, perhaps couldn't get a truck. So the Tannersville Company also constructed the dam in the Stony Clove to create this beautiful eight acre lake near what would become Devil's Tombstone Campground. The State Conservation Department had created a handful of campsites here in the 1920s, but the availability of CCC labor um, made it possible to expand the project on acreage newly acquired by the state. The CCC had uh, also built a hiking trail to Hunter Mountain. In the summer of 1934, Company 291 reconstituted a 3.7 mile long woods road from what is now Route 23A between Lexington and Hunter over the backside of Colonel's chair via the saddle between Hunter and Rusk Mountains and into the Spruceton Valley. This was to provide access for firefighting vehicles to the summit of Hunter. It included a 22 foot long steel bridge over Hunter Creek. In 1937, the road was indeed used to reach and extinguish a 26 acre forest fire. Um, this photo shows um, uh, CCC guards in a kind of an interesting moss covered uh, lean to or tent structure there. Um, they were stationed there to prevent uh, private vehicles from gaining entry to the forest, particularly during hunting season. They also built a truck trail to Catterskill High Peak, a trail that is today traversed by hikers headed to Huckleberry Point. In addition, eight miles of stream on the West Kill 
Hunter Creek and Batavia Kill were improved to enhance fish habitat. The state was all about um, uh, improving trout habitat to uh, um, encourage uh, well-heeled anglers, fly fishermen, uh, to come to the Catskills, to come to trout streams in, in the forest preserves um, and um, catch some trout and spend some money. This is kind of what this was about, not just environmental improvement, but economic improvement as well. So Tannersville Company 291, shown here in its official 1936 portrait, I think there's a couple of camp dogs in this portrait as well. Um, they, uh, this company also planted more than 800,000 trees across 5,500 acres in Wyndham, Halkett, Hunter, Jewett, Lexington, and Prattsville. After all of those accomplishments, Camp Rip Van Winkle was closed in October, 1937. Meanwhile, over in Margaretville, Camp 133, dubbed Delaware Valley Camp because it overlooked the East Branch of the Delaware River, was occupied October 26th, 1935. For three years, between 150 and 200 men of Company 1230 planted red pine and Norway spruce plantations, blazed hiking trails, and built lean-tos. They established a forest ranger headquarters at a former state fish hatchery in Huckleberry Brook. The DEC, by the way, still uses this facility, although it's not a, a hatchery. Um, they helped build the Woodland Valley State Campground and Simpson's Ski Slope, which I mentioned earlier. They strung a telephone line from Balsam Lake Mountain Fire Tower and fought forest fires in Ulster County and they helped locals clean up from floods and snowstorms. This was um, uh, a, a common um, use of uh, CCC men. In addition to the environmental enhancement work that they did, they were also a ready and able body of strong young men to help when, when um, there were natural disasters such as this, snowstorm, blizzards, um, floods, forest fires, uh, wind events, that sort of thing. Um, it was handy to have a couple of hundred uh, buff young guys who, who uh, you know, could be called in and be there in a, in a jiffy to help out. So of course, this was all hard manual labor. And you can see the exhaustion on these young faces. Speaks volumes. Well, Margaretville's camp was closed in October of 1938. Its company transferred to Masonville over in the far reaches of Delaware County, far western Delaware. A major accomplishment of its enrollees was construction of Beaver Kill State Campground near Livingston Manor, Sullivan County. There, 45 men lived in tents while they built campsites, fire pits, stream erosion barriers, and beautiful stone walls enjoyed by visitors today. Well, by 1940, and 41, the CCC was winding down as the nation readied for war. There was no need to work for a dollar a day when you could get a more lucrative job in a defense plant or maybe join the army. Many CCCers entered the service and found that their trainings in uh, manual labor and in living together in barracks under army discipline was good preparation for the military. The CCC was formally discontinued in 1942. So between 1933 and 1942, when the last CCC camp in the state was uh, shut down in Speculator in the Adirondacks, a total of 220,752 enrollees and supervisory personnel 
were employed by the Civilian Conservation Corps in New York State. More than $134 million had been spent on these camps and their work, and over 41 million paid to enrollees and their dependents. You just uh, really cannot assign a dollar value to the benefits that these young men derive from their service in the Corps. They gain strength, confidence, skills, tolerance, or to the gifts they left for us to enjoy these many decades later. There have been some successors to the CCC in our own time. The Student Conservation Association and AmeriCorps, for example, have engaged and inspired many young people who came to the Catskills to do environmental work and to our benefit, stayed in the region and the New York City watershed to take jobs in environmental education, stream management, and other important work. To them and to their predecessors in the CCC, I say thank you. And now I'd be pleased to answer any questions that you might have about the CCC in the Catskills. Well, thank you, Diane. That was wonderful and very informative. One thing that I noticed that it's not a question, but it's just a comment. You said that one of the species of trees they planted was the black locust. Uh -huh. That happens to be on the uh, invasive species list <laughs> of New York State now. Uh -huh. it's okay. Yeah, which I've kind of been fighting against for some time now. Oh, okay. But odd. <laughs> I also noticed that some of those guys seemed really young. Yeah, um, you know, they they did take take um, young men as as young as 17. But but I spoke with people who uh, lied about their age. Yeah, 15. I mean, if they were the, you know, oldest or the, you know, or the youngest um, in a in a large family, uh, you know, they if they, if they were capable of, uh, of doing any kind of manual work, which many farm boys were, mm -hmm. um, they were pushed out of the nest and said, you know, the, the recruiter is 10 miles down the road, you know, uh, take a hike and go sign up. Or they did it on their own, you know, um, yeah. if, if, even if their parents, did, um, you know, didn't, didn't like it. Um, so it was, um, yeah, it was rough times and kids grew up in a hurry and they had to, had to choose their path. We've got a couple of questions. Oh, one other comment about the locust that says from Oscar that says the locust was good for fence posts, so it had commercial value. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the Native Americans that used it for things that were similar to that too. And from Anonymous, did they make the signs that you see on the trails? I don't believe so. Uh, I, I I mean, I think the trails, the signs that you see on the trails now are, you know, they haven't been there for 90 years or 80 years. They're more recent. I don't know whether they, uh, I don't know whether the conservation department did the signs and the and the guys put them up or if the, um, the enrollees just basically built the trails and the lean-tos. I'm not sure about the signage. And from Dee Dee, Dee Dee terms for our historian and hunter. Uh, wondering if you know what year Devil's Tombstone was originally built. And thanks for sharing your history. Well, you're welcome. Um, I, I could get that for you. Um, it was in the early 20s, uh, but it was very modest. It was really like, um, you know, a couple of sites where that the, that the state just, you know, put there for, for travelers who didn't have a place to stay and could just park there for the night, I think. Um, this was early on in the 
uh, in the era of, of people, you know, packing up their stuff in a car and, and moving on, you know, going out and, and enjoying the countryside. Um, so it wasn't really until the 30s that the park was developed. And a question from Mark. Were any bridges across the Hudson constructed by the CCC? The CCC did not do a lot of um, public works projects. That was really more of the, um, uh, the, the, um, what's the name of that? <laughs> what's the name of that? Alphabet soup. The, um, uh, the WPA? Yeah, I'm sorry, because it was also a PWA. There were two, there were two derivations. I think the PWA was established after 1935. So the, the WPA and the PWA were um, agencies that employed um, uh, men who were married, who had families, who had dependents. And they, these projects that were, that whether they were bridges, uh, and I would guess that most of the bridges across the Hudson um, stemmed from this era. Uh, although I don't know that, I, I, that's not my area of, of study, but, um, but most of the schools in the area, for instance, were built by the PWA or the WPA, um, uh, including Hunter uh, and, um, and Margaret Mills. Uh, this was the era when, when um, school districts were centralizing too. So the, the, um, the federal money was there and the, to pay the labor to build these larger centralized schools, um, after which the um, one-room schools that, you know, in the outlying areas were, were um, discontinued. Uh, so the, these, um, so, the, so local men were largely employed on these public works projects. There were a lot of roads that were built or improved in the region. Um, and so these, the people who worked on these projects lived right in the area. They didn't have to travel very far. Whereas the CCC um, uh, constructed camps and imported kind of uh, uh, young men to live in them and, and, work, and their work projects went out from the camp in a, in a radius around the camp. That was the difference. Okay, another one says, do we know when the fire that is referenced at Layman's Monument was? I don't know about yeah, Layman's Monument. Yeah, I'm not sure either. There, there was a big there was a big fire there in 1935. I don't know if that's yeah. the one. Yeah. And a comment that Lake Taconic Park was built by the CCC. And a follow up from Dee Dee that says, I worked at Devil's Tombstone for eight years and I've never known the exact date, thanks. Okay. And also, did the CCC guys ever clean up where the Fenwick Lumber Company was on Hunter? Just curious. I, I do not know the answer to that question. What do you mean clean up? I'm not sure I know what you mean by clean up. <clears throat> Sorry. No. And from Charlie, how were the projects selected? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, the, um, the, the site selection for camps was, I, I'm, my impression is it was kind of a political process that, um, you know, there was some competition among communities to ha to host these camps uh, because of the obvious economic potential. You know, when um, you know two hundred guys get their five dollars in uh, in spending money and they want to go out and get a bunch of nickel beers or go to the movies, you know, they're just going to go down the road and do it down the street and do it. Uh, so the communities benefited in that way. Um, the work projects, it depended on what kind of a camp it was, whether it was a bug camp, for instance, um, or whether it was a forestry camp or whether it was a soil reclamation camp, as there was, there was one of those in Gallupville in Schoharie County, um, which agency it was that, that, that um, put together the work plan. 
um, the uh, the um, conservation department did that in Margaretville, for instance, um, and um, lined up a number of projects, including hiking trails. Actually, they they started to make a ski trail, um, and then realized it was taking too long to transport the boys to the work site and then back. They only had an eight hour work day. So, you know, so some of these these um, projects uh, were amended, um, you know, in the face of um, physical dif difficulties and availability of, of, um, of uh, workers. I mean, sometimes, you know, towards the end of the program, they had a hard time finding um, enrollees or recruiting enrollees. Um, so, um, so it really, it really varied. It's really mostly depending on the agency whose, whose personnel were stationed at the camp with these uh, workers. And we've got uh, answers from Dee Dee and from Carol that the Lehman fire was August 1900. Oh, much Just earlier. Very early, yeah. And Ken asks, will the program be recorded? It is being recorded, yes, Ken. And uh, available on your website or YouTube. I saw my father in one of your slides and I would love my family to see it. He was in Masonville. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Yeah, and yes, it will be available. I think we send the link to everyone who uh, participates. So if we don't, you can get in touch with us at uh, mths.org and we will certainly send you the link. It does take a few days to process though. Um, one last question. I don't know if I can do this or not, but I'm gonna try. Um, there it is, good. Can you see that? No. No. Okay, it's only being shared with me. What I'm trying to show you is a carving. Uh, it's a carving of FDR. It's in a piece of bedrock that's flat to the surface of the road that it's near. And there's one of FDR and there's one of Eleanor. I can send you the pictures. I'll send them to you on email. Uh, and they're in the area we call Cascadum now. Uh, so it would be part of Catskill. And I was wondering if you ever heard of any camps or work areas around in that area. Oh. It's um, east of Route 32, but it's near 23A. And uh, it's on a Grove School Road, I think is the name of the road. That's interesting. I'd love to see those carvings. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking in my list in this book, by the way, um, which uh, is sadly out of print, but it is available in, in um, I think, in used in, in some used book outlets online. Um, and thank you uh, very much, Debbie Allen, for Black Dome Press for publishing this book so many years ago. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm looking in this list to see if there was any, I don't remember any camp in Catskill. Mm. Um, and so, so I honestly, that would be an interesting thing to research to find out what exactly, where, who, who carved those. Who did it, yeah. They were a response to um, the New Deal programs or whether that they came later, I don't know. I mean. Mm. They had a lot of admirers, that's for sure. Yeah. Still looking, I'm not finding it. As I said, there were like 161 camps around the state and mm -hmm. many of them were um, at, were put to work developing state parks mm -hmm. from the Palisades to, you know, Long Island to Letchworth out in Allegheny County, um, Watkins Glen, you know, there were, there were so many. But I'm not seeing anything that relates to that location. But, um, okay. Send me the picture and I'll, I'll do some searching. I certainly will. Diane, and, did, did the, this is Adrian, did um, 
did the, the young men come mainly from like in New York State, New York State, or did they come from wherever they would? How are they recruited? How are they drawn to one particular camp or another? Oh, well, I don't know. I'm not exactly sure how they were assigned. They were assigned to companies. And then the companies, each company had a number and each camp had a number. And they were they were moved around and it looks like pretty much arbitrarily to me. I couldn't figure it out. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the company that um, served in Margaretville that came to Margaretville in 1935. Now, mind you, you know, the, the CCC had been in effect since 1933. So in 1935, Company 1230 was relocated from Idaho mm. um, to to the east, and mm. somehow, you know, and they uh, they made they built the new camp in Margaretville and, and were there for three years, and then they were moved to Masonville, another camp um, that I mentioned. So. Um, mm. You know, uh, a lot of guys, um, I mean, it was an adventure, you know, and they signed up not only because they needed the money or because their mother and father said, you're on your own, but because they wanted to see a little of the country. And uh, they'd heard about these wonderful Rocky Mountains and the, you know, wanted to be part of um you know, developing national parks, most of the national parks. If you've seen the um, Ken Burns documentary about the national parks, there's a, a quite a long segment about the CCC and, and the role they played in developing the national parks. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so a lot of them signed up thinking they were going to get sent out to the wilds of the West and that was a pretty exciting business. And, but some of them ended up going to, you know, Schoharie County. <laughs> you know, from here, they didn't go too far from home. So I don't really know what rationale um, the the um, the the army, uh, the war department, um, the labor department, and the war department had to move to to select people and move them around. It's very interesting, though. Have there been any way? Were were was there any follow up with all of these boys that became men? I mean, do, do they? You have the cccleggacy.org uh, connection. Is that is that for people um, who were part of the uh, CCC or? Yes, um, it was established as the CCC alumni, and um, and now it is called the Legacy Corps mm -hmm. because most of the alumni are gone. Um, mm -hmm. and it, it, you know, they're all well up into their nineties. Um, the youngest who had who had joined in the late years of the CCC are, are well up in age. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, they they um, there have been lots of books written about the CCC and about the influence that it had on these young lives. I I, I didn't speak to any of, of the the CCCers that I was able was fortunate enough to talk to. Um, they all just considered it the highlight of their lives that it, you know, it really taught them everything they needed to know for the rest of their life. I'm, I'm still good friends um, with a, a man named Al Polzel, who actually came to the book opening. You may remember Debbie um, in, in, uh, in Tanner's, in Haynes Falls, actually, if not on the historical side, we had it at the rail uh, train station. Um, and he didn't serve locally. He went out west, but he has lived for his whole life um, down in Dutchess County, and um, has you know he credits his physical um, well-being well into his 90s um, to those years in the CCC. Um, I visited him several times, most recently just last summer. And he walks like two miles a day. He's like 97 years old, and um, and he lives alone. He's he's pale and hearty, and you know, it's just he's just mm -hmm. loved that period of his life. Wonderful, that's great. Are there any more questions um, from the audience? I see one more, a couple more, or not? No, I mm -hmm. maybe. 
I, 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 was, I was knocked out of this. I had to, I had to log back in. Okay. Um, oh. Okay, let me try once oh, more right, then yes. to show you. Do you see that? No. No. Not yet. Yeah, it's just not coming up. I don't know. Oh, that's too bad. Why? But, but but so you tried share screen and yeah. Okay. All right. Carol Sale says Al is a good friend of mine. I thought Al served in upstate New York. He will be a hundred in June. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's great. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. Well, this has been wonderful, Diane. I, I mean, I have like all these notes I've scribbled all over the place. I now know why um, a, a pine plantation on my property, how it got there. Um, yeah. Well, so. you know, it's interesting because not, not all of these nice square plantations that you see, these uniculture, um, monoculture plantations, um, were planted by the CCC. The State Conservation Department planted many plantations before the era of the CCC and then after. So um, I guess you have to count rings to know, you know how big they know. are and who right, yes. and when they were planted. But Very certainly there are plenty of them around and we're grateful for them. Yes. I I noticed in the bite in the um, aerial view of Boyceville, it looked like there were orchards across the yeah, Selkie. I, I don't know whose those were. Uh, yeah, I, that's very interesting. I, I noticed that too. I'd yeah, like that, to know too. That's yeah. interesting. Right. Okay. Well, this has been wonderful. And thank you so much, Diane, and, and uh, left a lot of wonderful things to think about and to, and to, in, and to investigate. So thank you so much. Um, it was thank really you. a very wonderful program. And and Thank we'll make joining. sure that you get an invitation to our dinner. Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. Yes. August 28th. Actually, we do know the date. It's a Monday. <laughs> so please plan on it. And everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as uh, I have and, and I know Johanna has. So thank you very much. And thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.